Hello and welcome to News Desk. Now, this is a show where each week we unpack a particular topic, really dig down deep, speak to some great experts who can help us out with our questions, and also we rely on you. Uh, my name is Alex Forrest Whiting. And I'm Stacey Bivens. And you guys really do drive the show with your comments and with your questions. So please comment on each other, you know, have a conversation, and then write to us, and we can put your questions to the, our really powerful um, guests. I think they'd love to be called powerful. They I think are. they are. I think they are. <laughs> um, anyway, this week we're looking at the war in Ukraine and we're asking how is it changing the world? It's six months actually since Russia invaded Ukraine and Ukraine itself is on high alert at the moment ahead of its Independence Day with many fears that there may well be more military attacks from Russia over the next few days. The war itself though appears to be a sort of stalling. There don't seem to be any clear winners at the moment. And I think it's fair to say that it has been rather frustrating for Moscow in particular when we're looking at one region, Crimea. Now, to explain a bit more, we've got uh, a short video that was produced last week that we can watch now. <laughs> Now, now, from that video, it's uh, obviously there have been um, some more attacks or some incidents that have certainly happened over the past few days as well. We may talk about that a bit later, but that just sort of sets the scene for some of what we will be talking about. And we will be speaking to some great experts, as um, Stacey was saying earlier. Uh, we will be looking at what is going on in Ukraine, what's the global impact. And we will have Nick Connolly, who is DW's Ukraine correspondent, sitting here in the empty chair uh, next to us. And he will be filling us in on what it's been like covering the war. He's been also living in Ukraine for more than five years, so he'll be giving us um, some background about that and how he sees it playing out. We're also going to have a chat to a military and conflict expert who's got some interesting views. Um, he thinks, for example, that um, this whole war has weakened Russia's global influence. So we'll be talking to him about mm. that, who he thinks may well um, be benefiting from that, if that is the case, and also looking at other countries and organizations such as NATO. And finally, we will be speaking to a cyber security expert who will be unpacking that whole cyber war and which side Russia, Ukraine and the other players uh, have been doing well, are doing well, have not perhaps done as well as they should have done or were expected. So lots to unpack. Mm -hmm. um, do stay with us for the whole show. <laughs> and we have help to help us unpack all of this. We have our brain trust here. Uh, let's start with our, our editor. Dustin Hemmerlein. Hello, everybody. <laughs> the man with the curls. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and we have our engineer, Felix Fiedler. And we have our desk reporter, Hannah Costigan. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. <laughs> Hannah, we had got some comments earlier on, and um, so I wanted to put something to you. Okay. Uh, so Kornabod says, I love how the West blames others for their own sanctions backfiring. That's kind of spicy. <laughs> um, Just are bit. they backfiring and, and who's blaming who? 
Well, I guess the question here is, are sanctions actually working? And that's something that comes up a lot. So thanks for giving us the opportunity to talk about that. There are two ways of looking at this, whether the sanctions are working, is short term and long term. So in the short term, the sanctions didn't have the impact that a lot of people in the West who were pro-sanctions wanted them to have. The Russian economy didn't collapse. There was certainly talk when the EU introduced some of its packages of sanctions that, you know, people going, oh, this is going to be the thing that takes Russia out of the war. That obviously hasn't happened. The International Monetary Fund which is the UN body that um, coordinates international economic cooperation, they're predicting that the Russian economy will shrink by 6% this year. Now, some economists had predicted it would be up to 10%. So it's nowhere near what some people had thought might happen. And of course, the elephant in the room is that the EU in particular is still importing a lot of Russian oil and gas. And there has been criticism on that because people are saying, well, you know, if you just cut sort of how much of that you were buying, that would have had a much bigger impact than the sanctions that were implemented. And obviously, the EU has only said it will phase out how much Russian oil and gas it uses. And that gives Russia the chance to find alternative buyers for those products. And it also gives Russia the chance to use it as leverage over the EU, which we have, of course, seen them doing. And the man himself, <laughs> shouldn't really say that, Vladimir Putin, he has said that sanctions are not working. Yeah, but he's going to say that. That's the propaganda. Well, yes, he, he would say that. But I can also tell the viewers today that, you know, statistics put out by the Russian state statistics agency, so these are their own numbers, mm -hmm. are saying that in car manufacturing and like associated industries, in the first six months of this year versus the first six months of last year, that industry is 60% the size of what it was. Wow. And so you're seeing like Russian car manufacturers putting out cars that don't have airbags, Ooh. that don't have anti-lock <laughs> braking systems, that don't have air conditioning. And that's because they're not able to get the raw materials they need because of the sanctions to make these parts for those cars. And, you know, some of those like aircon are nice to have, like you could cope in a car, I think, with just the windows down. Yeah. But without airbags, I mean, mm. I don't see in any way that that's a good thing. So mm. I think you're being overly cautious. Who <laughs> <laughs> needs an airbag? Who needs an airbag? <laughs> so a lot of economists are saying that, you know, in the short term, the sanctions didn't have the effect that a lot of people were predicting. But in the long term, they're doing real damage to the Russian economy. Um, but let's not forget, and this point was also made by one of the sort of chief architects of the EU sanctions package, uh, Jörn Seibert, he was uh, doing an interview with the German magazine Spiegel over the summer, and he said, you know, sanctions are a tool in this war. Mm -hmm. um, he was also saying the West needs to send more weapons to Ukraine. And in that comment, they say, you know, the West is blaming others for the sanctions not working. I wasn't really seeing that in the research I was doing today. But what Western governments do need to do is make the case to their populations for why these sanctions are happening, because there could be real pain ahead for some populations in Western countries, especially as we get towards winter. Mm. But I was having a look at some recent polling, and here in Germany, at least, um, people still seem fairly on board with it. Dustin, can you bring that up for me? Um, our colleagues at the public broadcaster in Germany, ARD, um, asked the question, yeah, so they were asking people, do you support sanctions against Russia despite possible disadvantages for Germany? That's what that long title says in German at the top. And it was a very simple question. They were asked, um, you know, do you support this or do you not? And for yes, I support this, we can see that 58% of people they asked said yes, and 33% of people they asked said no. So that's still quite a large majority of the population saying, yeah, OK, sanctions may not have had the effect that we wanted and it may bring us some pain but we're still on board with this. I guess the question is, for how long will people be on board exactly. with this? Yeah. As winter, you mentioned it yourself, as winter is approaching and people are getting colder and paying I think, more. Yeah, I think the answer to whether sanctions work um, is something that will definitely change over time and it's always worth coming back to. Yeah. Okay. Well, speaking of polls, we have one for you guys. And the question is, which global key player has impacted the war in Ukraine the most? We have U.S., China, U.K., and Turkey. So, Alex, what are you thinking? It's quite a tough question because um, they all have in their own right. Um, yeah. Uh, I'd say, I'll just say this quickly, for the UK, I think, um, given the political situation that's been going on in the UK with um, the, the government and um, Boris Johnson, who's the Prime Minister, who's shortly leaving, it did him a lot of good mm. because they were seen, the UK was seen as coming to Ukraine's side very quickly, sending weapons, offering help to troops and training. So I think it's probably done them some good, but you've probably got a different 
answer. It's only my view. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go with Turkey. It, it seems to me that Erdogan has always felt that the, the, the EU in particular doesn't give Turkey the respect that it deserves and, you know, hasn't accepted it as part mm -hmm. of the EU. So here he is now being able to be like a kingmaker or at least bring about some peace. So he's, you know, he's a member of NATO, or Turkey is a member of NATO, and then you have um, he has a good working relationship, it appears, with Russia. So bringing people to the table. And mm -hmm. now he's uh, he helped broker a uh, deal with um, Zelensky out of Ukraine. So I feel like I bet his political party is doing very well in Turkey right now. Yeah. I hope But that's just my idea. You guys have your own opinions. So if you're and saying she's not swaying, it. not swaying the vote here. <laughs> but hopefully we'll be able to talk about Turkey a bit later in the show. Yeah. Because um, there is a lot to discuss about that country and it is very interesting. Also, when you guys vote, please tell us why you think that, why you've made your selection. I think now is a good time to get on our first guest. Yes. Um, it's Nick Connolly. Now, Nick is um, DW's Ukraine correspondent. And, Nick, we are going to clap as you come on. Um, he has been working for DW for some time and been in Ukraine just as he's putting on his headphones and getting ready for around five years. So even before, a well, long time before, um, the, the Russia invasion happened in February. Um, thanks so much for joining us because I must just say that you're supposed to be on holiday in Berlin and here you are. This is dedication. He is a team player. What Thank could be you. better than this? <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, just first impressions really for us. What has it been like living in a war zone? I think Kiev is a difficult place to kind of judge from because you are hundreds kilometers of kilometers away from those Russian troops now. Obviously, that wasn't the case at the beginning of the war. You could hear shelling in places like Bucha and it had been from the center of Kiev in those first weeks of the war. But now it's sufficiently far enough away that you can kind of fall back into the kind of situation you had before this invasion when you had that fighting in Donbass in eastern Ukraine for the last eight years. But you have air raid warnings, you have missiles falling on Kiev, on cities near Kiev. So while you can go out and have a drink and you can go to a cafe and you can order stuff online and all the kind of normal bits of kind of modern 21st century civilization still work, you still have that kind of residual fear in the background and people aren't really letting go. So they're trying to live their lives. They're trying to not let themselves be scared into kind of hunkering down and sitting at home all day but it's not normal life. And you hear about people who've gone to volunteer to fight. You see, you know, obituaries mm. on your social media feed every day. So it is mm. present, but it is not visible in the same way it was in the first few weeks and months of this war. But you said the war impacted where you live in Kiev. Yeah, that's right. I live not far from, or I used to live not far from uh, President Zelensky's office. I could see his building from my balcony. And that meant that within the first few days of the war, basically everyone scattered, everyone left. There was me and one uh, elderly lady lady in that building left. Wow. And wow. when you'd kind of come close to the windows or even tried to go on the balcony, you would see the people, the security people out there, the snipers getting very worried because they weren't sure what was this, what was this activity. So pretty soon I left because, yeah, it didn't really, wasn't practical living there. Every time you came back home, yeah. my neighbor would have shut the doors from inside, locking the bolts. And uh, yeah, we have all those warnings coming out of Moscow threatening to attack the Ukrainian political institutions, so that was a place that did feel pretty hot and still is. Mm. I have a, I just wanted to read some of the questions that we have for you. Um, Zach Appleton says, it's clear that Putin started this war, but the end is unclear. To what extent has Putin successfully mobilized domestic public support for the war? Well, that's actually the interesting thing. It seems like he's shy of going for the full mobilization, right? So he hasn't, unlike Ukraine, he hasn't called people up to fight. Mm -hmm. They're trying to get people to fight with financial incentives and offering you know, pretty huge salaries by the standards of provincial Russian towns. Um, but there's a sense that because those kind of early successes have now died down, that this is getting less interest among people in Russian cities who are now seeing the big Western brands leaving, who are seeing job opportunities becoming less, who aren't able to fly to Europe because, you know, those flight connections have been closed off, who are really feeling the impact on their daily lives now. And uh, there is a sense that the Russians are looking for a new narrative and a new kind of source of interest to keep people engaged with this. And just picking up on that, talking about Moscow, we've had um, this 
car uh, attack and um, the killing of um, Putin's guru, I think we call him, his daughter. Mm -hmm. Can you just fill us in a bit about that? Because there have been claims by um, the FSB, by, by, by the Russia sort of secret service, that this is all Ukraine's fault. I think we might even have some, um, some footage that we can show um, of, of the funeral um, that's been taking place. But can you just fill us in, give us give us names. Alexander Dugin, I know, is So he, he kind of sells himself as being a philosopher. He's a kind of political thinker, someone who was pretty marginal even... That's him here now. Yeah, um, with the beard, yeah. But up to sort of 10 years ago, he was kind of on the marginal fringe of kind of right-wing, extreme right-wing nationalist thought. And now his kind of ideas have become pretty mainstream in Russia since then, especially since this war began. Um, he's someone who... I think he's inspired a lot of kind of policymakers without being a kind of political figure in his own right. He's not someone who, you know, goes to the Kremlin every day, but he kind of has created uh, an environment that has allowed this war to happen and that has allowed lots of policymakers to kind of take stuff from his kind of playbook. Um, right now, I think it's a bit early to say, you know, who was behind this. There are millions of versions kind of swirling around. The Russian state media definitely pointing the finger at Ukraine, saying this was a Ukrainian agent, releasing pictures of the woman they say who did this, who even supposedly moved into the same apartment block as Dugin's daughter was living in with her daughter, entered mm. Russia on uh, in a mini with uh, Donetsk plates and then exited Russia for Estonia, having changed the number plates to Ukrainian plates. It all sounds pretty far-fetched for now. Very elaborate. Um, yeah, very elaborate and very high risk. Um, and right now, at least the kind of... Uh, liberal uh, independent media in Russia, they seem more convinced that this is some kind of power struggle within Russia and less, you know, a Ukrainian option, a Ukrainian operation. It's not really clear what's in it for the Ukrainians apart from showing that they could attack people in Moscow. Um, but it's definitely really brought the attention of people in Russia, maybe who were zoning out, who were focusing on their summer holidays mm -hmm. back to this conflict. And um, it's put Ukraine on edge, particularly ahead of the, uh, this Independence Day, where they're going to be celebrating, what, 31 years of independence. Well, exactly. I mean, you know, I was actually at the 30th kind of anniversary bash, which was a kind of huge parade last summer. Mm -hmm. uh, and since then, Ukraine has basically been fighting for its survival. And, you know, mm. in the early weeks of the war, not everyone, lots of people, especially in the West, were convinced that there might not be a further national day, that that might be the end of Ukraine in its independent form. That hasn't happened, but it's obviously uh, a very tense day, and especially, you know, this murder or this apparent murder, but also uh, the attacks on Crimea, on Russian annexed Crimea, that really have embarrassed the Kremlin and shown that Ukraine is capable of hitting targets far beyond the front lines. All the kind of Russian claims that they were, you know, in a position technically to prevent this have proven to be untrue. And I think there's definitely pressure on the Kremlin now to really basically take some revenge and to put the heat on the Ukrainians, not just on the front lines, but also in the big cities, and to try and kind of somehow browbeat and kind of intimidate Ukraine into maybe drawing back on these attacks and, uh, you know, pulling back from some of these more daring raids we've been seeing in recent weeks. Um, you mentioned the front lines, and Kim has a question for you. She wants to know if you've ever been on the front line at all. I have. I've been um, the front lines uh, since 2017 when I moved to Ukraine. Uh, my first story was actually about a family, a single mother with then two kids who lived, basically the front lines began where her garden finished. Wow. And within about 10 minutes of us getting there, we could hear the shelling in the distance. Mm. And me and my camera team and my producer, we all kind of basically threw ourselves on the ground and her five-year-old daughter started laughing at us. Because this five-year-old, she could distinguish the different shells by the sound. Wow. She could distinguish the direction, the distance. She could distinguish the different caliber of the different shells. So this girl basically spent her entire kind of conscious life surrounded by this. That's unbelievable. And, that is uh, unbelievable. And, and we went back to see her just before the war, and um, they were still living there. And the front line had moved slightly further. But, yeah, we've been there since. Obviously, you're always, it's always a bit stage-managed. That question of access with the military, yeah. you're not never fully free there. But we, we go there as often as we can. And the reason why they were shelling in 2017, because obviously we know that the war only began in February this year, but they were shelling in 2017 because they were still... Um, so this, this, this was the region. So basically, in 2014, when uh, U Ukraine's government changed... When, Maybe it's a good when, time to see a map, actually, Dustin. Maybe we just bring a, a map up of Ukraine. Exactly. So maybe people will remember the protests in 2014 on the Maidan mm -hmm. when basically you know, pro-European protesters 
uh, forced their pro-Russian leader into exile, basically into, into fleeing the country. After that, Russia came in and annexed Crimea and also stoked that conflict in the east of Ukraine that basically never finished, kept on uh, going. And there was fighting and there was shelling along those front lines in the east of the country, you know, basically without a pause for all those years until now in mm. February of this year, um, everything got going exactly. So you can see Donetsk and Luhansk there. So the village I'm talking about is in the Donetsk region, not far from a city called Bakhmut, which is currently the center of fighting. And um, yeah, it's kind of extraordinary how on the one hand people had got so used to it and kind of had accommodated themselves and kind of had had routines about, you know, what do we do if we hear machine gun fire? What do we hear if we hear uh, an artillery shell, the kids? Mm. And, on the, uh, and as normal as it seemed for them, when I went back to see them just before this war started, it turned out that their next door neighbor, an old elderly lady who I'd also interviewed, she'd just been killed the, the year before in the summer while working on her vegetable plot. She just was out on a morning, wow. it was a summer morning, six in the morning, doing her vegetables and um, a bit of shrapnel had, uh, mm. had taken her life while this family had decided that this was the least bad option they had open to them and were staying there. So mm. that was the situation then. Now it's obviously a lot more difficult because the, fire, the fighting is a lot more intense, so mm. access is a lot more restricted, and you always obviously worry that you're, you know, being shown what they want you to see. Yeah. Uh, and we're always, unfortunately, on the you know the Ukrainian side because obviously the Russian side is not uh, going to let Western journalists like us in. Yeah. So we're always on one side of the front line, but um, we try our best to put it into context and to kind of understand what it is we're being shown. And talking of the front line, we've actually got a hold of some of your camera roll from yes. your <laughs> smartphone. I feel a bit bad about this. I, uh, I don't mean, really feel that bad. But it's being, I think Dustin again will bring up um, your camera roll and we can see some of it. But it's quite, look, there we go. I mean, some, you've just got, these are just your photos. These are just photos that you've taken. And um, I mean, so much devastation. And only one selfie. And only one wow. selfie. Yeah, one. I mean, yeah. <laughs> but if we just go up a He's bit, he's a humble man. Just <laughs> one selfie. <laughs> See that with the with the hole in the middle of that building. I do remember covering that um, that bombing. But just tell us where that is and what and what that was. So that's the government building in Mykolaiv. Mykolaiv is a big city of about a half a million people very close to the front lines, uh, to Kherson, which is you know, the place in the south of Ukraine where a lot of the fighting is going on now, and. That's the office of a regional governor, uh, Vitaly Kim, who is a very kind of charismatic English-speaking figure. Lots of people might have seen him giving interviews in English, who um, basically, against all the odds, kept that region under Ukrainian control. Everyone was convinced that that region would be next, would fall to the Russians. It didn't. Uh, and he was saved by being late for work. So he would have been on a normal day somewhere, I think, 10th floor, somewhere high up in that building. And he was late and uh, stayed alive. But the extraordinary wow. thing is that just kind of a couple of hundred meters from that building, normal life continues. You can go to pizzeria, you can get a, a latte, and uh, people aren't leaving in any way other than way the kind of numbers that the government wants them to leave. Mm. There have been repeated calls on people just to get out while they can, but you know the experience of this war is that people leave when it's too late, when they can hear the shooting outside their house, and until then, they don't really, no one wants to be a refugee. No one wants to leave their homes. And just going back to, the, to your camera roll, um, there was one of a bridge... Um, which I think you had actually, you were talking about. Can we just listen to a little bit of this at the beginning? And then maybe you can talk us through. So you can see just behind the bridge above those unfinished houses, plumes of smoke, that's a couple of kilometers away. Every couple of minutes we can hear shelling, we can hear gunfire. And this is a situation in which people are being carried out on stretchers, in wheelchairs, parents with small children. Um, taking this chance before it's too late, willing to take the risk of moving in such conditions because they're obviously convinced that this is going to get worse and that it's worth taking this risk, even though people here in this have died trying to get out because they're expecting the situation to get a lot harder as the Russian forces draw closer. So just talk us through that that then when, when did you take that so that would have been early march so basically within the first few weeks of the war this was near looking towards irpin and bucha those are the suburbs of kiev where those um, extraordinary uh, attacks on civilians happened by uh, by russian forces we couldn't get there we could only get as far as that bridge uh, the ukrainian army for our safety wasn't letting us any further and i think they didn't want journalists kind of getting in the way but that was certainly a moment when the war was very present you know we could hear the shelling that was happening in Irpin and Bucha from our hotel in downtown Kiev. It was 20 kilometers away. Mm. And that was a situation where people were trying to get out. There were no humanitarian corridors. They were trying to 
you know, take the risk of getting across that bridge. You had people being carried on stretchers out, and routinely people were losing their lives because you know there was shelling of those people coming out. And um, yeah, it was a it was a very very difficult time, and you know it was also very difficult to report on because you know often you were stuck. we were stuck there wasn't mobile internet or f telephony there so you couldn't reach people there so you could only kind of talk to people who'd got out to try and tell the story and try to understand what was going on basically on our doorstep one of the things that i really like about your reporting is that you focus on people like the human aspect um but how does that take a toll on you as a journalist? I, I, speaking from my own experience, I know that when I was in the field, I would just focus on what I needed to do and making deadline. And then when I would get home, I would just collapse and just mm -hmm. be like, I need some time. Don't talk to me. Don't call me. Um, there's definitely that. Like? There's definitely that. And there's also a sense that a kind of sense of guilt because, you know, you're the one, you know, if things happen, who's going to be protected, who has the best way out, mm. who has the resources to get to safety in a hurry um, compared to people who, you know, for financial or other reasons who, you know, need a visa to get somewhere. I mean, Ukrainian yeah. refugees have been treated pretty well on the whole in terms mm -hmm. of having options to get out. Um, but it's, a, it's it's difficult. It's difficult. Um, and I think it's also very helpful to kind of get out regularly to then go in with fresh eyes and to kind of see it for what it is. Because I think if you're in country too long, you can start getting used to some of the things we've mm. seen there right. and mm. kind of losing that kind of horror or that kind of fresh, you know, Hence you being in Berlin and exactly. having a break of being here for the news desk. <laughs> if you're joining us, uh, we are News Desk. We're a show here on YouTube and we are talking about Ukraine and asking how is Russia's war in Ukraine changing the world? And our first guest who's going to be with us throughout is Nick Connolly and he is DW's Ukraine correspondent. And it's absolutely great having you here, listening to your stories, seeing your yeah. footage, even on your phone. I mean, we're not talking about proper the DW stuff. This is just stuff that you filmed and picked up along the way. Um, stay with us. We will be speaking to a cyber security expert later to discuss how uh, cyber warfare basically is shaping the war and also looking a little bit about at the propaganda war. But we do have our next guest who is joining us now and um, his name is Mike Martin. He's a military analyst and also um, specialises in conflict. Uh, he is a visiting research fellow at King's College London and the author of a book called Why We Fight and he is joining us from I think London now. Hi Mike, thanks very much Hi, for joining hi, us. Mike. And this is Stacy. You can see Hello. you can see the two of us. You can't <laughs> see Nick but he's nearby as well. Um, I just Nick. <laughs> it's very friendly, chatty round this table. So um, thanks very much for your time. I know that you're a very busy man, so we do appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to start by asking you um, that perhaps it's fair to say, well, I think it is pretty obvious that the war has not gone Russia's way so far. Do you think it can still win the war? Uh, well, it, it depends what, how we define winning, but not really. I mean... Usually when a country goes to war and then keeps redefining what its aims is, that's a good tell that it's not going to win the war. And, and we saw this actually with, you know, the Americans and the, the coalition in Iraq, and we saw it in Afghanistan. They sort of kept trying to change what the war was about, and we've seen that with Russia. It was about denazification. It was about overthrowing the government, um, and then it became about the south and and then it became about donbass and you know every so often there's a sort of a change and it's this is a really really good tell um that they they don't have a good underpinning strategy about what they're trying to achieve and so each each time they try and redefine the war in a way that they can win it um and each time the ukrainians well well frankly they've outfought them um the fundamentals of the war are such that I think Ukraine is going to win. Um, they have much better morale. Um, their levels of equipment are increasing, whereas Russia's levels of equipment are decreasing. They're fighting to defend their home territory. Um, they've got a, a pretty successful alliance system, some of the most powerful countries in the world. Um, yeah, I think it's a matter of time. And that's even with the threat from Russia of nuclear weapons? Yeah, I don't. I um. I don't see Russia using nuclear weapons. I think um, you have to look since so obviously you know 1945 was when nuclear weapons were used by America against Japan, and since then 
there has been a broad agreement underpinned by this idea called mutually assured destruction. And largely that, ag that agreement has been between America and Russia that um, if you use nuclear weapons, then we will use nuclear weapons on you and that will be the end of everyone. And during that period, during those sort of 80 years, we've had a number of wars um, of a scale larger than the Ukrainian war in which either of those superpowers has either been involved or supplied lots of weaponry to one side. I mean, Afghanistan in the 1980s is a key, you know, that's probably the closest, most recent analogue where the Americans poured, you know, billions of dollars of equipment into the Mujahideen to defeat the Russians, and, and that did effectively force a Russian withdrawal. Um, but there was no question of of nuclear weapons. And we've seen a lot, I think, since the conflict began. Uh, you know, Putin's just been, uh, well, I guess we could, it's not a very sort of analyst term, but he's just been mouthing off, hasn't he, um, about... Uh, well, he, you know, just like a kind of a toddler, it's amazing. Um, uh, you know, the, you're going to fear some consequences and, you know, somebody clearly in Washington and London and Paris, which are the three nuclear powers within NATO, got very steady hand and they're calling his bluff. Hmm. And um, and there's no new, there's not, not, not even any chemical weapons. And, I, you know, I think that the war has, and we need to continue to do this, but it's been quite successfully contained um, within Ukraine's borders and below certain thresholds of, you know, chemical weapons or nuclear weapons. And I, and I think that will continue. It's not, uh, ultimately, Putin realises that if he uses nuclear weapons, that will be the end of him. Yeah. Does that matter to him, though? I, sometimes it doesn't seem like he's thinking rationally. Um, Mike, we have a few questions for you already. Um, okay. K Cree 29 says, can you clear my doubt that what if the Ukra what if Ukraine has nuclear deterrent? When will the war happen? Wait, is that making sense? It doesn't make sense to me. I'm not sure. Would the war have happened had Ukraine had oh, yeah, war? Right. Thank yes. you. <laughs> Thank you for translating <laughs> English to <laughs> English. Okay. No, no, that's fine. Uh, uh, I spend a lot of time on Twitter, so you know when you, you like type quickly and then you sort of ah, oh, that's what. <laughs> um, so uh, okay, so the background to the question I think is that um, when the USSR broke up, Ukraine actually ended up with some of the USSR's nuclear weapons mm -hmm. on its soil several like Kazakhstan did and you know loads of the the Soviet states ended up with the mm -hmm. and there's an agreement whereby called the Budapest memorandum whereby Ukraine would give up its nuclear weapons or it would give them back to Russia effectively USSR became the Russian Federation and um and, and in return it would have its security guaranteed by the United States Britain Russia a couple of other countries, I think France. And, um, of course, that <laughs> hasn't happened, and it didn't happen in 2014. It, its territorial integrity was uh, compromised by Russia, one of the signatories of the Budapest Memorandum, in 2014. And the other signatories did nothing about it, really, which is why we end up with this war now in 2022, because nothing was done about that then. Um, your... Watcher asks whether Ukraine would have been invaded had it had nuclear weapons. Probably not, no. Because mm -hmm. what nuclear weapons are is they are the, you know, realistically, what are they? What are, when are people going to use nuclear weapons? They're going to use nuclear weapons when enemy forces are about to take over their capital city. I mean, ultimately, I, I would, I would imagine um, that's that's when they're going to be used, and that's you know another reason why I think. The West is trying very hard not to have the war carry on on Russian soil in any way to provoke Russia into that position. As long as it's contained in Ukraine, Russia won't feel like it is threatened enough to feel like it needs to use nuclear weapons. Mm. But yes, I agree with your hmm. watcher. I think probably had they had those kept those weapons, they wouldn't be wouldn't have been invaded <clears throat> wow. by Russia. Um, to stay with weapons, um, Schmedley. Mm. Do right <laughs> wants to know: Will more U.S. military aid to Ukraine become available in October? I think I heard talk of that, but I'm not sure if it is true. October starts the U.S. fiscal year. I have not got a clue because I don't have a direct line into. Um, <laughs> um, but what I, I guess what uh, uh, look, I would imagine that weapons deliveries are going to continue. 
and what Europe and America will be particularly trying to do is demonstrate that as Europe gets colder and Russia tries to use gas uh, as a as a lever to separate Ukraine from its allies, I think that the the Western if we call it the West you know as a shorthand will be quite keen to demonstrate that it's still delivering weapons to Ukraine uh, as a way of demonstrating that support. I think October interesting that I didn't think oh that's when their fiscal year starts I thought that's before the November midterms yeah, so I imagine that the Biden yeah. administration will that's want to be point. getting a massive massive delivery in before just in case anything happens untoward and, and Mike just picking up on that we'll bring back in Nick Connolly who's our um, correspondent mm. who's um, here mm. normally in Ukraine but happens to be here um, this evening very kindly um, we heard I mean, not that long ago, just like a few, uh, an hour ago or so, that Germany now is saying that it is going to be sending more weapons again to Ukraine. Can you tell us anything about that? I mean, so far it's all pretty vague, but there was a talk of a further 500 million euros worth of weapons. In terms of the timescales, that was all, again, pretty fuzzy. Um, some sense that lots of this is only going to arrive next year. The big thing here in Germany is that basically the stuff that the Bundeswehr, Germany's army, has ready to go and to send is, has basically been exhausted. So all this new stuff is coming from the manufacturers and mm. lots of these manufacturers basically haven't had orders of this magnitude for decades. So they're really struggling to kind of catch up and to really, in terms of things like uh, air defence systems. So Ukraine was promised one by Germany um, several months ago. It's still not arrived. It's meant to arrive in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Germany now saying that they're going to send a few more, but when that'll arrive is a big question, and there's a lot of frustration still in Ukraine about Germany's uh, unwillingness to give more in the way of concrete guarantees and to hurry up, essentially, and to send weapons on a kind of timescale uh, commensurate to what the US is doing, what the UK has been doing. So um, I think it'll be seen as a kind of gesture of goodwill from the Ukrainians, but I think there'll be a lot of question marks. As for the October thing, I also saw similar news in the Ukrainian media about this, some talk uh, I can't uh, kind of verify it about the kind of lend lease pro program starting at the beginning of October um, and that actually stuff is going to start arriving from uh, US manufacturers that has been specifically manufactured for Ukraine. That was something that was doing the rounds on Ukrainian media, at least in the last few days. So we've got to just wait and see if that actually happens then. But I guess, Mike, um, th they need these weapons. That is the only way that they are. I know you've said that you think that at the moment, the way it's looking, Ukraine well, well, Russia will lose the war, but nevertheless, it all comes down, or a lot of it comes down to weapons and warfare. Yeah, it does. Um, and actually, Nick brought out a couple of really interesting points. I, I was chatting to some fairly senior people in the British Army, and a lot of the equipment, and particularly ammunition, right? Uh, you know, artillery is very, very ammunition intensive. Um, and what went immediately came out of stocks that obviously the UK holds, you know, war stocks of, of ammunition in case conflict breaks out. And that's now gone to Ukraine. And, and now we're waiting to fill those orders from industry. But the industrial base of, uh, you know, Europe and the UK for producing munitions is not, you know, we don't fight huge wars. So it's taking time to get to get all of that stuff um to get all of that stuff together um but yeah i mean we, yeah weapons are of course important um they're not the most it's interesting they're not the most important thing um i think you know if you can you can make up for a lot with a with a good strategy um and the ukrainians i think are certainly demonstrating that so over the last three weeks or so we've seen some quite uh spectacular or showcasing of, of military activity on Crimea and that's very clever because that's for the Russians is the center of gravity and that's and, and that's also tied to Putin's psyche right because he the, the restoring of Crimea to Russian control was a big thing for Putin he was kind of suffering in 2011 with the population and this part of his narrative that he feeds the population about restoring Russian greatness. And so attacking Crimea with all the holiday makers having to stream back to Russia and it makes Putin and the Russian forces feel very unsafe and it means that they have to redeploy lots of assets to Crimea that they would otherwise be using in Kherson or in Donbass for the front lines. So even, you know, weapons are important, but there I think there are 
more important factors uh, in warfare, of which strategy and morale, I think. Mm. Uh, strategy, morale and logistics are probably the three most important things. So logistics is your supply. So just moving this on a bit, um, I just wanted to ask you, Mike, about how you think Russia's war is um, affecting its standing globally. I mean, in the region, first of all, but globally. Do you think, you talked about Crimea, this doesn't look good for Russia, does it? Um, well, it's uh, everybody's realised that the Russian military was a bit of a paper tiger, um, which is which is really interesting. And I think everyone was surprised by that. We, we were all surprised by that. Um, I think that within the the Russia sphere, so loosely the the, the old Soviet Union, so you know the Stans and and I think it's been very damaging to Russia. Um, Kazakhstan's a really, really interesting example. So I, I don't know if you remember, it seems like years ago now, but in January, there were protests in, in Kazakhstan and complaints about, you know, going to overthrow the government. And, and, and Putin sent 5,000 paratroopers there to, to stabilise the situation and basically keep the government in power. So if you can imagine a government that was pro-Russia, it would be the Kazakh government. But of course, w w what's behind the Ukraine war is a desire for, it was Putin's desire, but kind of fused with sort of many, many Russians' desires for Russia to be a great country again, so to re-establish the Soviet Union. So other bits of the Soviet Union looked at the invasion of Ukraine and said, hang on a minute, that's, we're not down for that at all. And so the Kazakhs have been really quite con condemnatory of, of the attack. Um, they're in they're in this Eurasian e economic union with Belarus and, and Kazakhstan and Russia and Kyrgyzstan and uh, and they're meant to sort of do military exercises and all that kind of stuff and so Kazakhstan's pulled out of military exercises with Belarus and you know they've taken a very hard line on it and um, and in retaliation the Russians um, so the Kazakhs sell gas to Europe through a mm. pipeline that travels through Russian territory and the Russians close the pipeline. Yeah. Um, so it's causing lots of problems um, um, in in the old in the old USSR. So who's benefiting? Um, who's benefiting then if if Russia is losing, for example, with Kazakhstan? Who's benefiting? Uh, China. So um, you know, Central Asia is for the last twenty years has been an area in transition. So Central Asia, so Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, uh, yeah. Um, is full of countries that used to be part of the USSR, but they, and, and, and still now, Russia is their major security partner. So Russia has troops in, say, Tajikistan and, you know, various other stands. And we just mentioned it put troops into Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. But actually, as the Chinese have developed their Belt and Road Initiative, which runs right through all of these stands, the major economic mm -hmm. partner has become China. So the security partners, Russia, economic partners, China, well, that's not going to last. Mm. And what we see, because the war is basically about a weakening of Russian power, that plays to China's advantage. And, and whereas before, you know, even ignoring the stands, the China-Russia relationship is one where uh, Russia is now a much weaker power. And Russia is a country that is full of resources. It's the world's number one uh, natural resource exporter, but where those resources are in Siberia is very, very population uh, light. Mm -hmm. and, but China is the opposite. China is very population dense and very resource light. So in, in the future, this is this is only to China's benefit in Central Asia and and vis-a-vis -vis its relationships with Russia. I mean, we, in terms of Kazakhstan, I think they are paranoid about being totally dependent on. China, if Russia ends up being you know, so heavily weakened or threatening them in their security, you know, obviously people like uh, Alexander Dugin, uh, you know, whose daughter uh, died in uh, Moscow this week, he was someone he, part of a group of people in Russia who've also been saying that large parts of Kazakhstan should belong to Russia. They're mm -hmm. populated by Russian speakers, ethnic Russians. So there's a, a wariness of Russia 
even if Russia is a you know, declining power, awareness of China. And we saw uh, Takayev, the president of Kazakhstan in Saudi Arabia, doing Hajj uh, just recently. Um, the Uzbek president also went to Saudi Arabia. So I think they're trying also to you know, deepen their links to the kind of Muslim um, Middle Eastern powers, um, you know, that shared religion, that shared cultural background as maybe, you know, the basis of helping them, them to try and engage with the wider world. Their problem is obviously that they can't get their energy out without Russia or without China. Mm -hmm. They're now trying to see if they can send resources across the Caspian Sea by ship to Azerbaijan to somehow get their resources to the world. Um, but they're in a very difficult problem by, by dint of their location and their, their, their absence of basically ports and access to the oceans to kind of engage with the wider world without these big powers who are on their doorstep and trying to kind of put them under their kind of uh, but control. But at the moment, it seems like Kazakhstan has support from China, and so maybe that's why it feels a little bit more empowered to kind of push back on some of the things that Russia has said or... I mean, and, and Russia needs, you know, I mean, there, there's lots of uh, sus suspicion and you know, uh, reporting about Russia trying to get around Western sanctions by using Kazakh companies, maybe importing t Western technology that Russia isn't allowed to import through Kazakhstan. Um, but there was an interesting scene a couple of months ago where the president of Kazakhstan was on a stage with Vladimir Putin in St. Petersburg at the Economic Forum, where he was basically the only high-level foreign guest. And he was asked, would he recognize the independence of uh, Donetsk and Luhansk? Yeah, and he you know, made no attempt to somehow mince his words and be any way polite and said it was a bad idea and that you know, chaos would ensue if you know, all these kind of uh, territories would end up splitting off. And basically, he, uh, you know, that was a rhetorical kind of slap for his host. And uh, there was no sense that he was in any way uh, going to kind of uh, you know, play along and uh, you know, say what Putin would have wanted to have heard from him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, I have more questions for you. Um, the Love okay. Scream says, I'd be interested Hello. to hear. Yeah. yeah, great name. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, the Love Hello. Scream. <laughs> it's not that type wow. of show. No, okay. Is it, yeah. When's this being broadcast? <laughs> it's a nighttime show. Um, I'd be interested to hear his opinion if Russia should get destabilized by the tensions. Is there a possibility of civil war and what might Western contingency plans look like? Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, one way of looking at the Russian state in 2022 is that it's the Russian empire that was put together in the you know, the 1700s, 1800s. Mm -hmm. um, because there's lots of, you know, Dagestan, Chechnya, you know, there's, there's lots of areas that have... Obviously, there were wars fought in the 1990s over the Chechens trying to become independent. Um, so it is not... And it's obviously, you know, 11 time zones and whatever is absolutely massive. And um, so as the Russian state becomes weaker... Um, does that risk instability? I mean, civil war maybe is a bit far, but does that risk instability and, and bits breaking off? Yeah, definitely. Um, what are Western contingency plans? I haven't got a clue. I've got absolutely no idea. I mean, they're not going to go in there. I mean, I think the main concern if Russia, you know, if there was a change of power in Russia or if there was a coup or if there were, you know, this sort of instability we're talking about, the main concern of Western powers would be where are the nuclear weapons? Russia's got 5,000 nuclear warheads, so that would be, you know, establishing who's in control, where, who has what weapons, what code, like, that is the primary concern, and once that's dealt with, then they'll look to deal with other stuff. So we have another question here, um, I, and I don't see the name, oh, Jasmine Singh. I wants to know why has Russia been shelling the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, especially when it is in Russian hands? A cause of friendly fire, very dangerous of Russia to shell it. Just picks up on what you were saying about yeah. nu nuclear and the yeah. difficulties. I, I hadn't heard that. I, ha I had not heard that. I, um, what I'd heard about the Zaporizhia power plant was that the Russians were ensconced there and firing from it at Ukrainian positions. Mm -hmm. Uh, in order to, I mean, maybe Nick's got something yeah. more up to date, but but you know, to encourage the, to tempt the Ukrainians to fight back, but of course they can't because the Russians are sitting in a nuclear power plant. Mm. 
I mean, it's an extraordinary situation. It's you know, Europe's biggest nuclear power plant, um, you know, several times bigger than Chernobyl was, um, and it is directly on the front lines. You know, they're... The Ukrainians are on the other side of the water. There's a, a reservoir directly you know, next to this power plant. And we've seen Ukrainian-held towns on the other side of that reservoir really getting hit time and time again, lots of civilian casualties. Um, interestingly enough, lots of the nuclear experts say that actually the way it's constructed is pretty safe, that unless it was a direct hit, actually the reactor is pretty safe. The bigger danger potentially could be a lack of power coming in mm -hmm. that is used to then to cool the reactors and to kind of you know, manage the safety. So actually, potentially you know, a kind of technical catastrophe that leaves that station without outside electricity coming in could also be potentially as dangerous as, as a kind of hit that doesn't quite hit the reactors directly. Um, it is an extraordinary situation that we're in and that you know, uh, people might have seen on social media those amazing images of Russian tech hidden within the reactors. So they even have trucks that have been brought inside the, uh, the kind of the, the, the complex directly next to the places where all the power generation is happening. Um, it is obviously by any standards incredibly irresponsible to do that, um, but seemingly no uh, question marks there among the, you know, the, the Russian leadership about doing that. Um, I, I think right now there is the fear in Kiev that, that this is all part of a Russian plan to basically scare, browbeat Europe into making concessions, to basically yeah. show we're willing to go there, we're willing to have fighting on the territory of Europe's biggest nuclear power station. It's a basically madman, you know, kind of uh, game theory, trying to basically put the risks up so far that basically the Europeans, you know, who in the eyes of lots of Russian politicians are basically cowards and not willing to take risks and not willing to go as far and put their own populations at the same risk that Russia is willing to do, mm -hmm. will then cave in, draw down their support for Ukraine financially, in terms of militarily. Uh, so I think this is definitely for European consumption, yeah. um, but certainly a very dangerous situation and one that's not really moved anywhere in the last few weeks. So there are two questions, Mike, that kind of tie into what Nick is talking about. The first is from Head Crab, um, who says, what would it take to bring Ukraine to the negotiating table? And then um, Goyo Goku says, how long will this conflict impact Europe's relationship with Russia? Is this a paradigm shift? Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't think there is a negotiated settlement to this mm. conflict because as far as Ukraine is concerned, you need to leave our territory. Um, and I think that's pretty understandable. Fair enough, they, yeah. Uh, yeah, and also they've seen what happened previously in 2014 when you appease Russia. They come back and take some more off. So I think as far as the Ukrainians are concerned, this is existential. And, you know, there is a memory, of course, in Ukraine of, uh, you know, Stalin and the starvation, the whole of the modern, mm -hmm. all the starvation of Ukrainians and stuff. So there is a folk memory of um, what you need to do with Russia. Um so, yeah, no negotiated settlement, I don't think. Um, and then how long will this poison relations with Russia? I think until the current government of Russia is swapped out for someone new. That offers Europe and the West a chance to reset. Um, and I think what's interesting is a lot of people at that time will look back at the early 1990s and see... Well, you know, as the Soviet Union fell, did the West make some missteps in the way mm -hmm. that they engage with Russia? Is there a better way that we can engage with the Russia going forward to try and avoid, you know, this this sort of thing happening again? Do you have a take on that, Nick? I mean, in terms of the kind of negotiated settlement, I think there was maybe a chance early on in the war when Ukraine and the Ukraine leadership itself wasn't so sure how this was going and how the population would stand towards this, where maybe some deal could have been cut in the first few weeks. You'll remember there were meetings in Belarus, then they were meeting in Istanbul, though maybe by that time it was kind of too late for a negotiated settlement. And I think Zelensky was calling for negotiations too. I mean, I think that was a question of blame game. I think there was a sense that no side could be seen to be closed to yeah, negotiations, okay. especially at that time, especially when Ukraine was waiting to see how the West would react. And they were you know, fearful that maybe European countries would take the excuse of Ukraine not going to talks as a kind of you know, argument for not supplying weapons or uh, providing other support. I think there's definitely consensus in Ukraine to 
insist on returning all territory to basically the status quo on the 24th of February. Mm -hmm. I think there is maybe some kind of room for discussion about does Ukraine then try and take Crimea and the bits of Donbass that have been in Russian control since 2014? Are they willing to kind of fight on and you know, recover control over all those areas? I think there is a bit more of a kind of debate in Ukraine on that. But certainly I think yeah, there's no appetite and people certainly are extraordinarily willing to suffer. You've seen you know, people all around me have lost their livelihoods, have lost you know, their, their, their property, are now basically living on the remnants of their savings, trying to work out how to kind of move on. You know, their normal kind of, the kind of protective kind of bubble of kind of savings and you know, yeah. resources available, they're, they're, that's all now used up. But there's definitely no call in Ukraine to end this in a hurry, just to kind of get life back to kind of convenient, normal, uh, you know, normal terms. So that's definitely um, still pretty much unquestioned within Ukrainian society. I was just talking to my um, to my hairdresser recently, who's now a sniper. So this guy has been cutting my hair for the last five wow, years, and that's he's now a career shift. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and you say it so so casually. <laughs> and, well, we've been trying to film with him, but obviously uh, snipers are pretty uh, vulnerable people if they right. get caught. So um, I think it's wow. unlikely that we'll be allowed to film what he's doing. How, but um, how, how accurate is he in translating what you want for your hair into what actually turns up on the top? He, <laughs> he's an excellent hairdresser. I can recommend him once that this is all over. Um, <laughs> he, was, he, he was actually at one point thinking of going to the UK because I think he has some family in, in, in the UK but he ended up staying and um, I think he, he was someone he'd actually never fought before but he'd done uh, kind of sporting kind of shooting and mm. biathlon and that kind of stuff as a kind of sporting <laughs> pursuit as a teenager and um, obviously when people got called up the fact that he had these special skills meant that he ended up there and mm -hmm. he's um, kind of six foot four and very tall so I mean not the easiest person to hide and to camouflage but I get pictures from him occasionally with those kind of netting and all the kind of weird outfits they wear to kind of blend Blend in with the bushes oh, and the grass. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I mean that's just that's just a very. I mean it's maybe a slightly more extreme kind of uh, fate, but I mean that is not. That's wild. Un it is. Unheard of in Kiev today. Wow. Um, mm. Thanks very much for that, Nick. Um, Mike, I just mm. want to sort of broaden this out a bit. We were talking about Russian influence and how it's. Um, obviously not doing so well on, in its own backyard. What mm. about um, in the wider world, um, particularly, for example, many parts of Africa? Mm. I'm just thinking now about that um, UN General Assembly vote right back in March about the war mm. and who was going mm. to condemn Russia and who was not. And it, mm. there were many countries in Africa in mm. particular who abstained. I think we might even have... Yeah, let, we me got a, up, let me pull up a map. Oh yeah, here's Dustin, and, who's going to just explain what, what we're seeing here. Yes, exactly. Like, that's yeah. uh, the second UN resolution vote, actually, um, in this month. Uh, and yeah, it just shows which countries are ab abstained or were against mm -hmm. um, uh, the UN resolution. Mm. So, so my uh, question really is, Mike, um, you know, you're, you're talking about them, um, perhaps uh, their influence waning, but it's not waning everywhere, is it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there was certainly a feeling in March that this was a this was a European war, and um, these guys didn't want to get dragged into it. I mean, Russian influence in those bits of Africa that are, that are blue there is not massive. Okay, yes, yes, in Egypt and stuff, um, and we can talk about Mali and Libya in a minute because I think they're special cases. But sort of the other ones, I don't see a huge. There's much more Chinese influence down there than, than Russian influence. But I think that they, it did stem from this feeling of, oh, guys, not another European war. We're not getting dragged into one of those. That's that's your problem. But I do think that the grain deal between Russia and Ukraine, obviously the big, you know, as you know, Ukraine produces a lot of wheat for the world market and when it can't export, prices go up massively and the people who suffer from that the most are... Um, the developing world because they need you know low grain prices to feed their population and actually it's very important for governments that you know Egypt subsidizes the price of bread for instance so high wheat prices are very damaging to the government exchequer and I think that the fact that that one of the reasons that that wheat deal came about was because I think Russia recognized that actually it was not doing itself any favors in continuing to uh, blockade Ukrainian ports or was not moving you know towards a deal that would allow the grain to flow because it, it, it would probably turn a lot of those countries from abstaining or keeping out of it to being you know seeing Russia as an aggressor that was causing them problems 
um, in in their own countries because of the price of grain and you know and other commodities, oil and so on and so forth. Um, mm. um, I, ju I didn't. Did you have a no? I was going to say there? anecdotally, um, I've come across comments online, and it seems like when there is support for Russia, it's usually India, Pakistan, and then these different countries in Africa mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. are saying that the U.S. has forced Russia's hand by expanding um, NATO and having these bases and encroaching mm -hmm. upon Russia's space. So why do you think that Africa um, is more pro-Russia, if I could say that, if it is? Um. Well, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if it is pro-Russia or whether it's it, whether it's staying, staying out of it. I, I, I think that there's a feeling that they're actually staying out of it rather than being, rather than being pro-Russia. Um, I think the route, if there is any support, as it were, for Russia, I would imagine that that route goes through uh, China because China has a lot of influence in a lot of southern and eastern Africa particularly, but also in, in places like Nigeria. There are a few countries where um, there is a, a direct Russian influence, uh, and that's that's through this organisation called the Wagner Group, which yeah. is a, a, a private military company uh, or a mercenary company, and um, very big presence in Libya, um, and now that the French have drawn down in Mali, also in Mali, mm -hmm. and then they actually actually um, helped provide the muscle for a coup in Burkina Faso towards the end of last year, um, because the previous government hadn't paid, would refuse to pay Wagner's bill, so they just went to another faction and said, <laughs> wow. "We'll help you." Oh my gosh. Um, Wow. And then there's also various, you know, it's wild. It's absolutely yeah. wild. And because basically what they do is they provide muscle for that government because a lot of these countries are fighting insurgencies or rebellions or whatever. Mm -hmm. And and but they get upstream contracts for you know extraction. They get rights to extract certain things. Um, just so in those sense. Mm -hmm. No, sorry, mm -hmm. I was just going to say, um, just picking up, you keep mentioning Mali, and we do actually have some um, pictures which Dustin can hopefully... Well, should we show where Mali is first, do you think? Just quickly, in case anyone mm. is wondering where Mali is in It was Africa. one of the ones in blue, yeah. We've got here's, yeah. Um, there we go. We've got a map. So that is mm -hmm. where Mali is. And um, Actually, let me zoom out again so you can see yeah. where it is. So on the world map on as the well. world map so it's there and also we've got some we found some um easy to find of course pictures of uh russian helicopters and jets in mali that would be inspected by mm. the by the president which we can um i think bring up now oh, um so that. it's yeah so it's <laughs> these are russian jets apparently um and helicopters so uh obviously russia does have um does have influence in that country in particular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is... So the the French... Obviously, the French is the old colonial power and, and they've been in Mali in force since... I don't know whether your watchers remember, but the, the Mali war in 2013 when the French... The capital was about to be overrun by a kind of Tuareg rebellion from the north that was interspersed with various Islamist groups. Um, and then the French intervened and propped up the government basically and then since 2013 has been fighting this completely unsuccessful counterinsurgency pretty much like all the other western counterinsurgencies are doomed to fail because they're based on the wrong premise like they go after terrorist groups rather than realizing that most of those conflicts are driven by land and water and all that kind of stuff so you, they're treating the symptoms which is the terrorist group rather than the cause which is the People don't have any farmland to grow mm. crops on or, you know, herders are encroaching on, you know, farmland or whatever it is. Um, and so uh, Macron said that this is, is not working um, and the, there was a coup in Mali and then they refused to have elections. They were delaying elections and then Macron said, OK, fine, we're going to get out. And the Russians, you know, geo geopolitics are balls of vacuum and then the Russians um, just slid in basically and same in Libya Libya is so chaotic and there's no one group in you know after this disastrous 2011 Franco 
British war to get rid of Gaddafi with no idea of what to replace it with. It's a complete, absolute strategic Failure. illiteracy from the UK and, the, and mm. France. Um, and it's created a you know a series of fiefdoms in Libya, which you know it's very easy for a group like Wagner to move in and get involved in oil smuggling and whatever. And yeah, you know, okay. Very lucrative. With Wagner, Josh is asking: Is Russia benefiting from this war in terms of making more friends in other countries? Because it seems like Russia is um, getting like land or mineral rights in exchange for helping these governments stay in power using these mercenaries. Mm. Yeah, no, that's exactly the deal. Yeah, Josh is exactly right. But I think what's interesting is the Ukraine war has made that much more difficult because um, b because the Russian army and military has suffered so many casualties, they've had to reinforce with Wagner groups. So there's lots of Wagner group mm. operatives on the ground in Ukraine. Mm. And that's meant that they've had to pull them out of some of these other places or rotate the experienced guys out of Mali and Libya and send them to Ukraine and put in the less experienced guys. So it's, it's the Ukraine war is a huge draw on all of the Russian resources, including Wagner, which mm. means it's had to strip out um, stuff, people and resources from other places. Wow, I never heard that. You yeah, want to say something? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we don't have reliable figures on how many Russian losses have been you know, seen since this war began. The Ukrainians saw about 40,000 dead and many more wounded. I think you know, most Western uh, intelligence agencies think the figure is significantly less, but still in the tens of thousands. And you know, it's expected to be significantly higher than the Ukrainian losses because Ukraine has been fighting in a way that is more protective and less you know, uh, risky in terms of uh, you know, putting lives at risk. But we've definitely seen that you know, people who have become have been taken prisoner by the Ukrainians, for instance, have been fighting in Syria in recent years in other mm. conflicts. So these are the people with the most experience who are now increasingly either being wounded or being taken prisoner. And you know, Russia doesn't have that you know, level of personnel to really kind of uh, draw back on. And we've seen even the Wagner Group now trying to recruit, you know, if, if the reports to be believed in, in prisons in Russia, tr offering what? people you yeah. know, freedom yeah. and wow. financial yeah. incentives uh, to go fight because yeah. you know, Putin is desperate to not let this war affect the kind of middle classes of St. Petersburg and Moscow. Yeah. So they've been recruiting in the kind of poorest regions of Russia, often mm -hmm. um, regions which are predominantly inhabited by various minorities within Russia, mm. Buratia in eastern mm. Siberia, for instance, or Dagestan in the northern Caucasus, or now among uh, prisoners. But anything that would kind of avoid people who somehow are part of the kind of bigger kind of middle class elites in Russia from you know, them being called up and sent to Ukraine. Mm. I'm My, floored. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's wild to me. Wow. We've, okay. we've had quite a lot of wild comments so far, haven't we? Yes. And um, hairdressers and snipers <laughs> and um, whatever the name of of the uh, of the person on the late night um, oh, the question. Oh. You have to find the love, that scream. the love, love scream. The love scream. Um, but bringing it back to uh, bringing it back to the here and now, uh, Mike, you've been with us for a long time. We really appreciate your time, and um, thanks to everyone who's been. Um, sending in questions to Mike. I did just want to uh, briefly ask about Turkey. We've kind of talked a little bit among ourselves about the role Turkey and um, President Erdogan has been playing in the war in Ukraine, because obviously we're looking at how this war is changing the world. Um, how do you think Turkey is playing it, playing both sides, and, and is mm, it succeeding mm, in that? Mm, mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, Turkey is a classic bridging power, isn't it? I mean, look where it is on the map. It mm -hmm. sits between Europe, the Middle East, you know, it's on the Mediterranean, Russia's there. So it's right in the middle of all these um, um, different power blocks, if you like, or cultures, you know, it's sort of they go in different directions of the compass and you end up with different cultures and different countries. Um, so actually what the wars enabled Turkey to do is to become even more of a bridging power. And that's great for Erdogan. He's got his elections next uh, April, I believe, and huge economic problems in Turkey, massive mm -hmm. inflation. I mean, we think inflation's bad in the UK uh, or in Germany or in the US. It's sort of 80 or 90% or something in Turkey. It's ridiculous. Um, and so this enables Erdogan to um, strut about. And so earlier on in the war, um, Turkey closed the Bosphorus Straits to Russian military shipping. 
So it stops Russia reinforcing. It also closes aerospace to Russian military flights going into um, uh, Syria. At the same time, it, uh, you know, with Finland and, and, and Sweden joining uh, NATO, uh, he, you know, blocked that initially and then and then and then rode back um obviously played a key role in brokering this grain deal uh he's been selling drones to ukraine but also buying russian oil so i mean he's having a a, a wonderful time and <laughs> we, we, basically creating the image that he is the indispensable partner that nobody can do without in the conflict um Potentially setting himself up to be the the mediator in an eventual, you know, discussion. We, we do have a Google um, photo, actually. From yeah, we've got yeah. strutting yeah. about it. We've got some pictures that, that. that Dustin is showing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah. Yeah. exactly. This is him and the Iranian president and uh, Putin is, holding hands. Is, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which I think. Like, did some... you see now? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, like, uh, sometimes they're just like, uh, these government, um, uh, you know, heads of state such, find such weird poses for their photos, right? Like, uh, who told them to yeah. do this? Like, it's like, what is I'm happening so, here? What yeah. is this? It looks so cultish. It's so strange. Exactly, right? Yeah. But there's a, let, let's see if you can dig up this little video. So Erdogan was meant to be meeting Putin recently and... Putin is famous for keeping people waiting. Yes, I and, saw this. But other one kept Putin waiting on camera. <laughs> yeah. So there were loads of press there. They were meant to do the photo call, and other one just just not long, just a minute or so. But you know, Putin checking his watch, sort of. But to be, be fair, that's the Turkish <laughs> way. I remember I, I lived in Istanbul for <laughs> three years, and a friend was coming over, and he's like, I'm going to be late. And I was like, all right. And then after 15 minutes, I was like, okay, deuces, I'm going to go live my life. And then an hour later, he calls me, where are you? We had plans. I was like, did you think I was going to stay at home for an hour while you totally violated my time? You're trying to hold me hostage? <laughs> but that's very much, and friends will always say, oh, I'm 15 minutes away. And then you learn okay it's more like 45 minutes <laughs> so i have to for erdogan that's a cultural thing i think <laughs> not, not necessarily a slight <laughs> not sure that yeah it may well be i'm not sure putin received it that way no, he right. did not have a happy bunny he was not, not a happy sure bunny I, I was actually able to find the video give me one second oh dustin Oh, yeah, fantastic. Okay. I'm quick. he I'm quick. is quick there you go yeah look how yeah so awkward look, check it hey. Yeah, oh, it's great. That is uncomfortable. Oh. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Looking at the flowers. The best served cold. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. White. Yeah. I mean, like white. White's my favourite flower. Yeah, but it, oh. I mean, who chooses mm. those floral arrangements? And I mean, it's just, yeah, it is mm. all. Look at this. Oh, this is just... my teeth. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, this is really like... long. <laughs> Chicken. Can you get me a toothpick? Someone get me a toothpick. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Wow, he does not look happy. It's amazing, it's still going on, look at that. Yeah. It's awful. We've had to pull out of it, which take up the whole show. Yeah, it's too long for us. Mike, we have another question um, that has to okay. deal with Turkey from Gabriel Sunvar, um, who wants to know, mm. should, should Turkey suffer sanctions for playing both sides? Turkey is a NATO member and should be acting as one. What do you think? Yeah, but that, that's the should versus the reality of the situation. The reality of the situation is Turkey's got lots of cards and the Americans are trying to court Turkey mm. and so are the Russians and so is everyone else. And, you know, Turkey's in a very strong position. The war has made Turkey able to play its traditional role uh, on steroids. Mm. Thank you so much, Mike, for all your time. We've really kept you... Um with us, busy, lots of questions, some of them working, um, hard. Yeah. working great hard. answers. Thank great you, answers, Mary. yeah, and thank you very much. I really appreciate it. There were actually had many more questions that I wanted to ask, but we have um, truly run out of time. Can I so. also just quickly say, Mike, you just seem so cool. <laughs> I was thinking like, oh, he's a military wow. guy. He's going to be like <laughs> gruff yeah, and yeah. blah, 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 blah. So but what's the audience of this? Sorry, so can I just check? Chill. Yeah, what's the audience of this YouTube thing? Is this going out to a lot of people? Or <laughs> We'll get back at so. you let you know. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. No, but really, thank you so much. It's been absolutely fascinating. Cheers. And we've, we've no, zipped around the world. There were many other um, mm. places we could have talked about. But thank you. Very much appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thanks, Stacey. Thanks, Nick. <laughs> so just very quickly, Nick. Um, this is a hard one for you, but what do you take? That was a big, long discussion. But what do you take away from um, some of what Mike was saying? I think, particularly at perhaps at the beginning, that um, he doesn't think um, that that um, that Russia has the influence that it once did, particularly in its backyard. Um, even though we were talking then about Africa and um, showing, you know, how many countries there have abstained or abstained in or did not want to condemn Russia in this war. What's your takeaway from all of that and in terms of Russia now and um, how the war has changed it? You know, that, that was our question. How is Russia's war in Ukraine changing the world? Um, how is it changing Russia? I think it was interesting um, he used the term paper tiger um, for the Russian military and I think there's definitely a sense that yes people are f scared, neighbours of Russia are scared of those nuclear weapons that are still there but I think that kind of uh, direct fear of Russia being a kind of reviving its military and somehow getting back to a kind of power situation closer to what Europe had to deal with during the Cold War, I think that is Jeff definitely gone. Obviously, this is a war that is claiming you know, thousands of lives, but it is one that Ukraine, with, you know, it has to be said, fairly limited military support, uh, is you know, winning slowly. I mean, whatever winning means. Um, I think uh, that is something that has really accelerated Russia's decline. Uh, and that we were, he was talking about neighbors like Kazakhstan looking elsewhere for security support, looking mm -hmm. elsewhere for, uh, you know, countries with the resources to help them modernize because Russia obviously has failed to modernize its own army uh, and is not able to offer that kind of thing to its neighbors. Um, and I think there's a sense that, uh, you know, Russia's bluff, which you know, he was talking about in terms of the nuclear bluff, that at the beginning fairly direct willingness from the Kremlin to talk about nuclear weapons and basically threaten, hold Europe hostage with uh, nuclear weapons, that basically has been ignored um, in the knowledge that Russia's military leadership for all the kind of madmen posturing and playing and the willingness to take risks like in the Zaporizhia power plant isn't actually going to use those weapons because they know that means destruction for them too. Yeah. So um, it's definitely a loss in terms of that potential on Russia's part to intimidate and to kind of browbeat its European neighbours. But it does, that doesn't mean that the dying in Ukraine is going to end anytime soon. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, let's bring in our next guest because he has been waiting very, very patiently for us, hopefully enjoying the conversation as much as we have. Um, because I want to talk uh, now about cyber security, cyber, um, cyber warfare, particularly with what's been going on with Russia. So um, there you are. Thank you very much, Matthias Schulzer. You're an expert in cyber security um, with the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. And we very much appreciate your time and your patience. So thank you very much. I just wanted to begin by asking how important has cyber warfare been in Russia's war in Ukraine? Hello, everybody. Nice to be here. Hi. Well, it is. It certainly played a role, but not not to the extent that many people were expecting, probably. So, the Russians relied heavily on cyber espionage operations, um, even setting setting the battlefield with operations going back to at least last year, where they set the ground for you know surveillance and reconnaissance efforts, figuring out who is suing the government, figuring out where planning is going and stuff like that. So this certainly played a role. They tried to disrupt the Ukrainian government in the early stages of the war, kind of in a you know decapitation blow, if you will, by deleting files and ministries, uh, the aim of slowing down the government response to the ongoing invasion. Uh, and they tried to combine it with land operations on the ground to, to limit its success. So there are some operations there, but nothing nothing um, in terms of a big, you know, gigantic cyber attack against critical infrastructure so far. But and when you were talking about that Russia had started before they had actually invaded, um, you're talking about a malware. And is that Whispergate? Is that what you're talking about? I think we've got some um, screenshot of, of the sort of image that would come up on your screen. Yes, we have this here. Uh, um, if that's you... at least uh, maybe you can tell me, Matthias, if this is the right thing I found. That's kind of what I uh, found a whispergate message might look like, might look differently, but the text is kind of what I heard it would it would be on screen. 
Yeah, probably. Whisper, Whispergate is a, is a malware that, that wipes hard drives. It's called Wiper, and it goes back to mid-2021 when it was deployed or when, in, when initial access happened. So in 2021, they, they basically breached uh, networks in Ukraine, then they lay dormant for a while, and then they triggered um, Wiper with its ongoing ground invasion and, you know, to achieve synchronized effects, basically, with the conventional operation. But it was nothing like what um, Russia had done in 2017 with Ukraine when it came to cyber. Yeah, and sorry, when it came to yeah, cyber but, warfare. But this, 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 this might be the outlier here. So in, in 2017, they launched NotPetya, which is one of the most devastating worms in history of, of the internet and then cybersecurity in general. It costs uh, billions of dollars internationally. So it was paired with an. NSA uh, offensive tool that was leaked from the, from the NSA and then it spread or it crawled out of Ukraine. It was delivered through a taxation software that was used also by international companies like Merck and Maersk, like the logistics company and so forth. And that's, that's why it infected their systems as well and deleted data worldwide, you know, causing millions of damages and causing shipping delays and uh, terminals where, where uh, cargo ships couldn't be unloaded and stuff like that. Uh, but NotPetya was probably like an, an accident to some degree because it was targeted against Ukraine using this Ukrainian taxation software and then, you know, it, it spiraled out of control. But Russia has used many more wipers since then and all, all of them, they were talk there are like five or six different generations of wipers they used in the Ukrainian war so far. Hmm. And these versions have been way more targeted than NotPetya. And um, when Russia invaded, about an hour or so after that invasion, uh, they also targeted a satellite network, didn't they, to try to destabilize Ukraine? Yes. So they attacked the, the KSAT um, satellite communications networks, and this is one of the more interesting cyber operations in this conflict we've seen so far. Um, so on the day of the invasion, they, they hacked satellite communications networks over Eastern Europe, uh, and it went down, and this affected military communication in Ukraine, but also some emergency communications of firefighting trucks, for example. They also use um, satellite communications as a redundancy in case of, uh, you know, traditional communications phase and stuff like that. So the satellite modems went down. They were deleted with another wiper, um, mm. and this affected many, many more things like, for example, wind farms in Germany and Greece mm. and Poland and Hungary. And, you know, this is one of the cyber operations that has a clear synchronicity or joint effect with the conventional ground invasion, because if your communications go down as a defender, the Ukrainian army in that case, this clearly has tactical advantages for the offensive troops uh, when, when they can communicate and coordinate and you cannot. Mm. So how has Ukraine um, done at defending itself from these attacks? Well, you have to keep in mind that Ukraine is one of the countries that has most experience when it comes to hand-to-hand -hand combat or hand-to-hand -hand cyber operations, if you want, right? So they are dealing with this sort of harassment since at least 2014, and they were able to gain lots of experience in fending off attacks. So they had wipers before, they knew that this might be coming, and they took precautions. So they have pretty good IT security teams out there working 24-7 uh, to recover networks. There was a Microsoft report recently that highlighted that uh, Ukrainian IT operators were able to recover wiped networks affected by wiper malware within eight hours or so, which is extremely fast. And I doubt that many Western countries could replicate the, the efficiency and the speed of that. So this is one, they're pretty good at defense because they had plenty of time to learn. And they also get help from international partners like um, the EU and the United States and US Cyber Command, particularly sharing so-called threat intelligence with them. So they share knowledge about ongoing attacks and live telemetry from um, uh, IT security tools like Windows Defender on Windows platforms and stuff like that. And this gives them a tactical edge and uh, the ability to react quickly to infectations. Hi, Matthias. You have mentioned um, the EU, and I have two questions that are for you concerning that. Um, Stephen Hope asked, do you, do you see the cyber ex war extending beyond Ukraine, Russia, to Europe? And then Kim also asked, do you think the European grid is right now even more vulnerable due to possible Russian hackers. Right. Okay. So this is one of the 
the common questions and, and many in the West feared that there might be some sort of escalation coming to, to Western Europe, particularly uh, and to the United States for that extent because of weapon deliveries and stuff like that. So the Russian hackers, we know they, they have an interest in attacking power grids. They did so before in 2015. Uh, in Ukraine and in 2016 uh, in Kiev, also in Ukraine, where they shut down the power temporarily for a really short time. Uh, luckily, uh, the Ukrainian defenders were able to have a kill switch and, and you know, bridge uh, circuitry analog in an analog fashion. So they were prepared. And we've seen another malware called Indestroyer 2, which targeted Ukraine in, uh, in March or in April. And from this, analysts in the West arrived, okay, Russia might still have an interest in targeting Western infrastructures because this next generation Indestroyer, Indestroyer 2, was way more modular and way more uh, customizable to, uh, to attack similar networks and grids, like, for example, in the West. So they demonstrated the capability. The question is, are they going to do it and what can they gain with it? What can they gain with it? They can gain a symbolic win. If the power goes out in, I don't know, Germany or France in winter, while everyone is relying on, you know, electrical heaters mm -hmm. because of the gas shortage, this surely would have a psychological effect. So this mm -hmm. is what they could gain. I doubt that they could gain longer lasting effects or, you know, crippling of an economy or something like that. Because it's really hard to attack a power grid. You have to keep in mind that this is not just one grid, but multiple grids that are connected. They, they are different companies, they have different equipment, um, they have different areas that they cover. So shutting down the entire grid is quite complex endeavor and takes a lot of preparation, takes a lot of time. We're talking years in preparation and it takes a lot of money. And if you can only get a short win of a couple of hours, do you spend the resources there? Mm. It's question mark. Yeah, right? that makes sense. Um, Nick, you obviously were in Kiev when all this was happening and has been had been happening in the past few years. What was it? Um, I mean, did you notice anything um, right at the beginning when war was declared? Did you notice that there did, did it have an effect on people like you? I mean, that was the extraordinary thing. So I was actually on a train heading east towards Donbass uh, on the night the war broke out, and um, we noticed scarcely anything um, my mobile phone connection was you know in the middle in the middle of a kind of ukrainian village somewhere in eastern ukraine was better then as it is now uh, than any connection in germany um, you have four five g in most places you cost five euros a month for unlimited data um, wow. i think the thing that is really important in Ukraine is that it is a lot more of a digitalized society than lots of Western European societies. Mm. Um, Ukrainians have a digital passport that they can use on a government app, it's official government ID. All their kind of data is backed up there now, obviously lots of kind of you know, uh, data protection uh, campaigners would have lots of question marks about putting everything in one place. But if you hack that app, then you actually have an extraordinary amount of data about most Ukrainians. Uh, and most Ukrainians who need this app to do lots of you know, basic government kind of work, getting, paying and filing their taxes, making sure they have the permits to take their kids out of the country, um, you know, all kinds of medical records, it's all connected in one place. So that's why this was so crucial for Ukraine, because it is a society that in lots of ways has kind of jumped from kind of paper directly to a kind of fully digitalized society in a way that I think lots of kind of Western European countries kind of still years We're away still from. We're still waiting for in Germany. You Can know. I just tell you that sometimes for, in order for my internet to work properly and definitely my phone I have to open both of my doors and sometimes I have to stand <laughs> on the patio I'm not even joking so a lot of times sometimes you know when work calls and can you come in to work for you know to fill in for somebody I don't get the call not because I'm not paying attention but because it literally is not coming to me. Yeah. And then a few hours later, oh, you've missed a call from VW. Well, Which maybe is what you should... just need to move to Ukraine, Stacey. That's, that, that's, <laughs> yeah, a, that's, that's not the solution. About that. but, there, but there are lots of memes on groups for Ukrainian refugees in Berlin and in Germany more widely, who are now for the first time in their lives receiving paper letters from various German government organizations. Yeah. Yeah. And they're just not used to it. Yeah. I, I had to explain to someone I know what a fax wow. is recently because she was asked to send a document to a government office by fax because they wouldn't accept an e-signature on an email. So they said either you oh, send it by wow. post and it takes a week or you can send us a fax. Oh, and um, I had to walk her through uh, what, you know, what the is. procedure is. Oh, my goodness. Bless. Um, I, I did just um, have a question, um, Matthias. You were saying that, you know, the threats that could, there could be to... Um, 
obviously to Europe following the question from Stacey. Is there not a bit of a risk for Russia to start really focusing on uh, countries outside Ukraine? Would they not be, um, you know, breaching, <laughs> breaching the terms of war, but breaching um, a, a NATO? You know, I mean, could could NATO not respond mm. to something like that? I know it's mm. not. I know it's not military, but if it's cyber warfare, is it not a risk for? Russia, if they were to really, really do something big. Right. You're pointing to something really important here, and this is also one of the explanations why we haven't seen any big cyber operations with, you know, critical damage effects or permanent damage uh, in the West so far from Russia, because this could likely trigger the NATO collective defense clause, the NATO Article 5, because uh, NATO has the position that if a cyber attack in scale and effects, so affecting lots of targets at the same time and having devastating effects like uh, an armed attack essentially, so people die uh, or buildings explode and stuff like that, this could trigger collective defense and it also cause, um, could cause kinetic retaliation in the worst case. So Russia is pretty much aware of that and they don't want that which is one of the reasons why most of the Russian cyber operations and most cyber operations in general stay exactly below this threshold of armed conflict mm -hmm. because no one wants this, this type of escalation with NATO. And this is also one of the reasons why we haven't seen, you know, big operations because there is this risk that this could escalate. But as I said, you know, most operations stay below this threshold of an armed attack and even the wipers, which are pretty aggressive in in terms of malware out there, they are not severe enough in their effects to, to you know, cause an escalation like that. Uh, Matthias, Gabriel Sunbar has a question. Um, considering the scale of how Elon Musk's Starlink affected the battlefield communications, moving forward, is Starlink in risk of attacks by Russia or Chinese forces? Well, yeah, Starlink is certainly one of the surprises in the conflicts. Um, it's pretty, yeah, it's, it's likely that they are becoming uh, more interested in, in hacking Starlink infrastructure because it plays such a crucial role in the, in the Ukrainian defense effort, whether it is, it is for, you know, frontline communications and uh, strategic communications or, you know, sending propaganda videos from the front when they tow another, uh, when a tractor tows another Russian tank and stuff like that, which is coming often from the front directly. Uh, Starlink Internet access is also useful for, you know, drones. Uh, Ukraine is relying a lot on commercial drones, which they buy online and which they are crowdfunded for some degree. And, you know, you need internet connection for these or some of these as well. And Starlink certainly plays a role in that. So, it is likely that Russia gets interested in Starlink and trying to hack it. Whether they succeed, it's a question. And um, I'm not really sure how the infrastructure is set up of Starlink, but I think it's pretty complex infrastructure with all the satellites and then tracing individual communication is pretty hard. So they, they might try it, but if they succeed, it's, a, it's an open question. Um, thanks, Matthias. Um, we want to just branch this out a little bit and look at the propaganda war. And Hannah has been looking a little bit at this. And I think um, in particular, Hannah, DW's own reporting, which has been undermined a bit by um, by fakes. And you can fill us in. We can talk about that. Yeah. So first, I want to show you um, a fake video that basically steals uh, DW graphic tem graphics templates and tries to emulate the style that we produce our social media videos in. So Dustin's just brought it up on the screen now. We're not going to play it because obviously um, it's fake and we don't want to... Um, give any credence to it but this video it claims to be about a ukrainian refugee in germany who has been apparently extorting women by threatening to expose nude photos of them and he's sort of trying to get money from them um and this video was put out in dw style and it's even got the exact same end slate that we use on our social videos there so someone's clearly gone to a lot of trouble to rip off um this, the way in which we do our content. And some of my colleagues in the fact-checking department actually uh, put up an article explaining how this is not a real DW video. And I think we can see that on screen now. And if you scroll down a bit, I can talk about this image here. So um, what some of you will obviously not know is that one of the other jobs I do for DW is that I work in our social video department. And one of my jobs is fact-checking the scripts for the videos we produce. But then it's also fact-checking the final video before that goes out on line and looking sorry Dustin could you bring up the article again um, scroll down keep scrolling there we go yeah I want to I wanted to talk about this image here because um, it's just looking at it 
with purely my sort of grammatical and editing head on, there are a few clues that this is not actually a real DW video. And it's incredibly basic, and you wouldn't know this if you were outside our, our organization, but the fact that they put a full stop at the end of the text on this oh, yes. story slate, this is something we don't do in our digital videos. And also, if you read out the text, it says, dozens of German girls have been extorted by Ukrainian extortionists. That's not actually a complete sentence in English. That's more in the style of a newspaper headline, and that is not how we would write those uh, story texts. So it's very subtle, but if you know what to look for, there's clues that this is fake. And my colleagues on the Fact Check team have highlighted, it's a bit difficult to see, there's an orange circle around the beginning of the word extortionist. But you can see these little serifs on the Xs give away the fact that this is not actually the font we use for our social media videos mm. either. And the rest of that article um, goes into a bit more detail about other news organizations that this sort of fakery has um, happened to, so like BBC reports and I think CNN as well. So it doesn't just affect uh, DW, it affects a lot of established media organizations. Very frightening that it that it can that that it's being watched, that it's out there. And if, unless you've got a real attention to detail, you might not know that it is a fake. You might not know. And I was looking a bit into reasons why people do this, and it's so that you know if they want to put out a particular viewpoint from their own media, they can then say, oh well, look, the BBC agrees with us, or DW agrees with us, because here's a video that they've made that agrees with our point, but it's not actually come from those organizations originally. And, yeah, my colleagues in the fact-checking department are actually taking a longer look at this and they will be putting out a video in more detail about this kind of thing later in the week. So Great. keep your Thanks, eyes out for that. And you wanted to just chip in there, Just Nick. a quick thing. Um, it's an interesting tactic in Russian, mainly state media. You see articles based on comments to articles in established Western media, which often seem to be created by bots, by you know, fake users. So they kind of justify running the story by saying the users of magazines like Der Spiegel or kind of you know, well-known uh, British American newspapers say X, Y, Z that is favorable to a Russian line. Uh, and you know, the question is, have they written those comments themselves to then you know, use that as a springboard to push a narrative? But that's definitely something that's happening more and more often. Um, and Matthias, you're the expert in all of this. What have you noticed about how misinformation, disinformation, fakes have been used in this war? Well, what you described is, is pretty pretty much the standard playbook since the Cold War, essentially, if you want. So they're still utilizing the same techniques, but of course they, they amped it up on steroids with all the digital technology out there. So, you know, in the traditional disinformation cycle, you have target audience at the beginning. So you, you screen the target population for obvious discursive rifts and, and, you know, gaps or cleavages and discourse. And refugees is one of the central uh, points of cleavages in, the, in Western societies since 2015 with the refugee situation we had there. And then you, you identify what are the different positions and then you try to amplify or, you know, create content that fits into this decision that's, that or uh, ruptures that, that sparks, you know, anger. All the idea is to create anger and enragement on social media and you create content and you target this content with all the lovely techniques the social media companies have readily available for you, available for you if you're an advertiser. So you can do micro-targeting and display this content that, to the users that like certain things and are likely more being affected by that, then if you reach a critical mass and you can even amplify it with, you know, social bots and um, fake personas, uh, then it reaches a critical mass. And then sometimes it's picks, picked up by legitimate media and then you can refer to it on Russian state media and you have created the legit legitimacy for the article. Uh, so this is classic playbook. And Ukraine recently dismantled one of the bot farms, which was quite interesting. So they, they dismantled the Ukrainian intelligence agency. They dismantled a bot farm and they uncovered uh, thousands of SIM cards and machines that uh, where you can combine multiple SIM cards uh, into one another to create different you know, online accounts, different phone numbers and authentications and stuff like that, all more or less semi-automatically where you can push different narratives um, at the same time through various accounts. So this is not fully automated. You still require human operators to do that, but it's it's one of the examples how this works nowadays. Uh, Matthias, we have what we're calling a rapid fire round where I, we just toss out a few questions to you and you take like 30 seconds to answer. Um, this one is from David Wilson. And he says, will the Western high tech sanctions on Russia diminish their abilities to engage in cyber warfare? 
That's a good one. I don't think so, because cyber warfare is relatively cheap and you don't need high tech equipment for that. Mm. Uh, and you can rent most of the stuff out there on, 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 you know, black markets and stuff like that. So uh, I think this is rather unlikely. OK. And Michael Herrer says, are cyber attacks a way for Russia to raise money for its war in Ukraine through ransom or are sums too small for that? Yeah, so there was some speculation whether Russia would follow the North Korean model of raising funds through cybercrime, essentially, whether it's ransomware, whether it's attacking online platforms where you can gain money, whether it's gambling sites, casinos, online gaming, uh, uh, trade platforms and stuff like that. The um, thing is, the North Korean economy is way smaller than the Russian one. So in order mm. to, to have profit here, it, it would require a huge <laughs> amount of, you know, money stealing. Um, so could be that we see it to some degree, but I, I think it's unlikely that it will be, you know, full scale operation or something like that. Thank you very much. Uh, very, very much indeed, Matthias, for uh, chatting to us, answering questions all over the shot there. I know some about <laughs> cyber warfare, some of them obviously about disinformation and propaganda. And there's much more that we could talk about it because obviously in terms of um, the propaganda war, we see it on both sides and um, Ukraine and um, also Russia um, in terms of trying to promote their side and who is winning the war. So thank you so much uh, again for your time. We really appreciate it. And um, I think there's a lot of food for thought there. So thank you very much. Thank you. Take thank care. Thank you, Matthias. Nick, sorry to come back to you. This is kind of mean. <laughs> but um, just in terms of what um, he was saying, particularly about cyber warfare and, and our, our question about, you know, how this war is sort of Chain, changing the world. Do, do you think, have you been surprised at um, the fact that there hasn't been a big, there wasn't a big Russian hit in particular? You talked there about malware, talked about taking out the satellites at the um, at the beginning of the war. We've talked about other things that have been going on, but there hasn't been this big one-off push to really try and take U Ukraine off grid, I suppose. Or if it has been going on, it's not not succeeded, right? It's the second paper tiger that I, I think these kind of doomsday scenarios are one thing that, you know, in the space of a couple of hours or days, it would be possible to basically paralyze a country, at least in a country like Ukraine that has a very strong IT sector and is pretty IT literate, certainly in, in comparison to lots of Western European countries. They have been able to be agile and, you know, to be creative and to find alternative solutions to make things work and li essentially for the population, for ordinary people who aren't trying to do anything too complicated, there haven't been major blips. Credit cards still work. The, you know, the banking sector is still uh, functioning. You know, that, that state government app, DIA, which basically has most kind of interactions with the government, has been stable. And actually, weirdly enough, this has actually ended up kind of being an advert for Ukraine's IT sector. Yeah. They've got a, a minister for digital transformation who uh, has basically recruited most of kind of Silicon Valley to his side to help mm. protect Ukraine, to help come up with solutions, you know, starting with Elon Musk, who sent those Starlinks right at the beginning of the war, when you remember, you know, soldiers out in the middle of kind of uh, snowy forests, you know, setting up their Starlink to kind of stay in touch with a command back in Kiev. I think this has really actually shown off Ukraine's prowess when it comes to IT and, you know, provided probably uh, quite a lot of seeds for, you know, Ukraine's recovery after this war as a country that is, you know, pretty on its feet and actually has tried to kind of uh, compensate for some of its structural deficits and its kind of weaknesses by being earlier and more proactive about introducing kind of, you know, the, the kind of services and uh, options that, that some of these technologies provide without being maybe as scared of kind of issues like data protection uh, as lots of Western European countries are and have been pretty, you know, um, happy to take those risks yeah. for the benefits that brings. Okay. I wanted to bring in the poll that you guys oh, took. Yes, the poll. Um, there was 555 of you that voted. And so to bring the question to you again, which global key player impacted the war in Ukraine the most? The U.S. was 73 percent. My pick, Turkey, is... Only oh, 10%. Well, it's doing better than my and pick of just UK. Just a second. Very, very just a second. <laughs> I guess you guys weren't uh, swayed by did, our... Did they tell you why in the comments? I No, you guys. What happened? 
<laughs> you didn't say. <laughs> well, I, think, the reason I guess I should have reminded you. They got so caught up in the, with the experts that they forgot to. I think it might have something to do with the fact that the audience, a lot of audience that comes from the U.S., a lot of Americans are probably watching this. So um, maybe they just voted for their home country. Oh, it could be. Yeah, we do like ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's very, very possible. But thank you guys for taking part in the poll. And is there anything else, Hannah, that you wanted to pick up on that have come from the comments at all? Yeah, so I got asked a very specific question uh, right at the start of the stream, and it sent me down um, some rabbit holes I've never been down before. So <laughs> thank you very much for that. Glad um, you came back. Yeah. Anthony, Leo, Sahaya, Daphne, I hope I've pronounced all of that correctly, asked me um, whether the war would have an impact. Let me, I did, yeah, he's, they asked... Given that Ukraine was a major exporter of neon gas before the war, which is used extensively in EUV lithography, do you think the chips shortage might become worse in the coming days? So wow. that was a lot to look up and uh, a, lot, a throwback yeah. to my chemistry and physics studies at the end of a secondary school. Uh, for those that don't know, um, EUV lithography is extreme ultraviolet lithography. This is basically an etching process used for... Um, microchip production and neon gas is one of the noble gases in chemistry it's inert it's very unreactive so it's sort of used as a buffer to sort of sort of cushion against explosions and things like that um in this process I'd, it's sort of produced by two big companies in ukraine who are responsible for 45 percent to 54 percent of the world's uh, neon gas production um so yeah those um, firms uh, both reported to reuters that they were ceasing production at the start of the conflict uh mm. and yeah so the scramble has been to find alternative sources some companies did have stockpiles and so whether it's sort of going to affect chip shortages based on how long those stockpiles last uh, in the research i did find that it's a uh, neon gas is also a byproduct of steel manufacture and um some I, I i signed up to the royal society of chemistry's teaching uh, materials <laughs> during this during, during this. the stream <laughs> to, to find wow, this out this, this is impressive so research they they, they, they were say, they were of the opinion this is the royal society of chemistry that um steel plants could be an alternative source uh, for neon production but you need they need to be very large steel plants just to produce enough amounts for this kind of thing um and there are some companies who are developing neon gas recycling systems, so they don't need new gas for their chip etching process. They can use the gas they've already used. In terms of a conclusive answer of whether this will affect um, microchip production, uh, it's hard to say. Uh, the, the consensus seems to be that, you know, it could take months to scale up alternative forms of neon production now that these two major Ukrainian companies aren't operating. Um, I did find... Uh, some dissenting voices who are saying, well, actually, um, the sort of most advanced forms of extreme ultraviolet lithography do not use neon gas, so it's not going to be a problem. But uh, that was just one opinion uh, on the various uh, websites I read to come up with a partial answer to this question. So, Anthony, Leo, Sahir, Daphne, thank you very much for that. Um, I learned a lot this evening, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know why you decided to ask something so specific, but I'm glad you did. I'm so yes. impressed with your knowledge, and I, I mean, I'm slightly blown away, Hannah, with your, I don't want to call it geekiness, but that is impressive. I mean, I think it's a fair description. <laughs> but she's not alone, because Anthony, Leo, Sahir, Daphne asked that question, and I'm just like, oh, what do you do for a living? How do you know about this? We need to talk. Yeah, I, I had not heard any of this, and this is a very uh, narrow angle on... Um, I mean, obviously, the war is affecting all kinds of supplies for different types of goods and chemicals and products, but, yeah, this this was a completely new one to me. So, yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, wow. Anna. Very talk, impressed. Talk about added value. I know. <laughs> talk about added value. Talking of added value, just quickly, I want to answer the question. I want you to answer the question, Nick. How is Russia's war in Ukraine changing the world? Um, we've heard a lot over the past hour and a half. I don't want a long answer, but in your, how do you think this war that you have been living through yourself is changing? Is changing the world? I think it's forcing Western countries to basically turn back the clock and in some ways return to the Cold War in terms of spending more money on their military. Nick, having to, be a uh, on the mic. So it's forcing lots of governments to kind of go back to the thinking of the kind of 1980s, the Cold War, prioritising the military, producing equipment and actually really working out if their militaries are capable of uh, 
protecting their countries. But, you know, here in Germany, for instance, the military was just not a priority for the last few decades. On the other hand, Russia has been shown to be less of a threat or a real threat than it might want to be. Its capacities have not lived up to those expectations. And it's shown that a, a weaker, smaller country like Ukraine, with a bit of creativity, with that kind of sense of unity and that willingness to fight, can actually hold up a much bigger neighbour. Thank you very much. That was great. Succinct. Yeah. succinct, yeah. Very well summed up, I was going to say, but succinct <laughs> is the word. Thank you, Nick. Nick, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, it's been absolutely great having your first-hand experience or your experience of living in Ukraine over the past few years, mm -hmm. and particularly just you know, also being able to take a step back and giving us more of that global perspective. So thank you very much. On your for that. holiday, no. On your I mean, holiday. It's, thank it's a pleasure. You. I mean, where else do you get, uh, you know, the best part of an hour to uh, go on? So <laughs> to I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for joining. We've really, uh, we've had a good chat this evening. We really appreciate all your questions and comments, which I know Stacey will pick up on again in a moment. Yes. Um, I did just want to thank everyone round the table as well. Stacey, maybe is that thank supposed you. to be your job before? We can share the duty. Go on then. I'll say thank you to <laughs> Hannah. Thank you to Hannah for just being so nerdy. N nerdy, <laughs> geeky. It comes naturally. Ke chemistry, physics, I'm very impressed. Thank you. Um, thank you very much to Dustin for being the boss and not um, not telling us off too much. I hate you this title, it. but uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here. He's a very good boss. He's a good boss. That was good. And Felix... Thank you for being Felix. That's all I have to and say about that. Buttons. And if you would allow me just a moment to be a fangirl, I love you. <laughs> and so my other job for DW, one of my other jobs, is to be a showrunner um, for the news. And one of my first ones, Alex, was in the studio with the anchor. And she was just blowing my mind talking about Brexit and all this stuff. And I was like, I want to be the Alex Force Whiting of US reporting. So wow, I love that I got to sit next to you. <laughs> it's been brilliant. It's been a blast. Thank you very much. And we will be back. Well, actually, sadly, I won't be back at this time next week with the times coming up on the, yes. will be coming up now. Stacy will be. You probably know better be at saying here. what the time is. I can say it's, it's, CET, so that's Central European yes. time. It's at 2000, 20. London 1900. It's when we get over to the, to the US, I get a bit confused. But I but always have to. I pull out my phone and look at the world clock because <laughs> I'm terrible at, at math. Um, so if, but if you can't wait until then, we have a show that we'd like to tell you about on Twitch. Um, it airs. It's going to air Wednesday and Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and the channel name is called DW News Hangout, and the topic will be what's happening in Russia. Ah. So, check out Twitch. So that would be interesting and a good follow-on for what we've been talking about. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. Have um, a very good evening, afternoon, morning, wherever you are. Um, and thank you very much for spending your very precious time with us. We really appreciate it. And we will see you soon. Take care. <laughs>